Water is fantastic in all its forms. Solid in the form of ice, liquid as water itself and gaseous as steam. And apart from being 70% of what we're made of, it's fundamental to the technology that we take for granted every day with our use of trains and aeroplanes and cars and all those things. And that the Industrial Revolution started in the Derwent Valley with water mills being driven by the power of the rivers of water flowing from the hills. And then it developed through the use of steam, which is the gaseous form of water, into all the other forms of energy that we now use today. advent in water wheel technology came with the invention of the overshot water wheel which this uh, small specimen is an example of. Um, basically the water was pushed in at a high level and in the, generally in the direction the wheel wants to travel in and as well as getting the force out of the flow of the water you get the effect of gravity driving the wheel around um, as, as it pushes down to the bottom. This wheel which was made by students at Ambergate School, uh, mounted on this frame made by students at Watt Stanwell School, uh, drives this horizontal drive shaft, as you'll see in a moment. So the water goes in at this point here. And fairly quickly, it builds up quite a momentum in the wheel. Proportionally, a real water wheel would have much bigger buckets for the weight of the wheel than this one. But this was just, uh, these buckets were available in IKEA at a very reasonable price, so they ended up getting used. And you can see that it's making this other shaft rotate, as is illustrated by this pair of leaves, which are very temporarily fixed to the end of the wheel here. world's first sock based water wheel came from the, uh, the fabulous stocking making machine in North Mill and uh, just talking to various people in Belper about what would be a good and funny way thing to do and somebody came up with a sock water wheel idea and uh, then it just became a technical problem of how can you do that so we uh, that's what I had to work out, so we worked, we formed plaster bandage vague foot shapes over balloons, let them dry, applied socks over them with stainless steel hoops around the tops of the socks, um, all this stuff done with community groups and schools and things, and then uh, smothered the whole lot in polyester resin, which makes it totally waterproof and hopefully resilient for a few years. Tried to cover all the socks in resin because I kind of figured that in the basement of Balfour North Mill they might start to go mouldy otherwise. With this piece, which I've made for the Silk Mill Industrial Museum in Derby, um, I've used an undershot water wheel because originally the mill was powered by an undershot water wheel. Um, I thought flippers would be quite a nice thing to make a water wheel with. Um, and basically you can see that the energy that's being made by the water wheel goes through a very simple crack mechanism just to make this head, which has been made by the cert group from Duffield Road, Derby, make the head nod as the wheel goes round. One of the features of an undershot wheel is you need a much higher flow of water to actually make the wheel go round and do anything. So this has got a much bigger pumping in it than either of the other two sculptures I've made. So here we are in the, in the wheel pit of another mill at Cromford. Uh, this is currently used as uh, a basket 
factory. I think it was a basket works, originally, I'm not sure. But uh, behind me is the water wheel actually going round, driven by water. It's just dripping off a bit. Uh, the pipe's going overhead to supply the water to the wheel. It comes in right at the top of the wheel, just about, and it's angled back in the direction of the movement of the wheel, and that gets as, as much energy as possible out of the water. At the moment, it's just ticking over. He can actually turn it up and have it going quite a lot more powerful if he wants to. And on the side of that water wheel, there's a geared, uh, there's a big gear wheel thing, and this gear wheel here is currently moved away from there because apparently the neighbours complained because it was so noisy when it was running all night and it was rattling about a lot. But normally that would drive, that would locate with the gear wheel on the side of the water wheel. And this shaft over my head, I've got to be careful not to move because I'll fall off into the abyss below me, um, goes across into the mill on my right hand side. And there would have been some other power takeoff thing here, there's another pulley here. But most of the power take off will have been on the inside. So drive belts would go around pulleys like that and drive all the machinery, like all the stuff that's at Masson and the stocking making machine at Belper and all that stuff like that. Over the centuries, water wheels developed from being just a paddly thing that fitted into, uh, that dipped into a river to being an overshot wheel which actually used gravity and the energy that could, that could be imparted by the use of gravity uh, to become you know, an overshot water wheel. Um, we're at the Silk Museum in Derby and behind me is the inlet fan of a giant jet engine uh, from 70s through to sort of 90s uh, passenger aircraft. Um, Loosely speaking, this would be a turbine, although they don't actually call it a turbine in the form of uh, jet engines, because they, they, they refer to the pressurised components inside the engine as turbines. Um, but basically, this is using fluid being pushed through uh, to make a, a, a radial force happen, uh, tangential to the flow of the fluid. Um, and this could apply to any fluid, it could be water, it could be air, it could be any kind of gas or liquid at the front of the engine uh, basically starts to compress the air into the combustion chamber of the jet engine um, and it goes to about, up to about 40 times normal atmospheric pressure by the time it's in the middle of the engine and then it starts to burn so it gets even more compressed and gets shoved out of the back and makes this enormous thrust that actually makes hundreds of tons of aircraft go up into the sky which is something that's always amazing to really it shouldn't work, all those big heavy things. The part of the engine that we were looking at previously was the inlet fan. Now on this engine it's a different kind of inlet fan uh, because it sucks it in sideways rather than straight in at the front. Um, but then when the actual parts that they refer to normally as turbines in jet engines are the actual parts in and after the combustion chamber uh, where the air or the fluid, by which point it'll have the fuel in it as well, is at absolute maximum temperature and pressure. Okay, so here we are at Mass and Mills in Cromford, and uh, they actually generate their electricity using turbines. Uh, they normally use a more modern turbine, this is their old turbine that they're running specially, and uh, as you can see, it's quite a noisy piece of equipment. Since they've turned it on in the last two minutes or so, the water level in the mill stream dropped by about a foot, so it uses quite a lot of water. But uh, it's very efficient in its uh, taking the power from the flow of fluid and turning it into another energy form, which in this case is this rotational shaft behind me, which goes and drives the generator in the main building. Rotational energy from the drive shaft, from the turbine outside, is uh, 
transmitted through that green box behind me into this generator set next to me and then next to that there's a modern looking metal cabinet which apparently phases the electricity so that it can be in synchronisation with the national grid so that the energy that that water is generating in the river Derwent now is actually being fed into people's homes around the country. The problem with the turbine, well, not encountered problem. They're having real trouble trying to make it stop. It's such an efficient device that it just wants to keep going. There's such a weight of water on the turbine blades that despite the fact there's a, a bizarre and very fantastic sort of looking stick thing that they use as a brake and that they've tried to hydraulically shut down the buckets in the turbine so that it will stop. It's really, really trying to keep going. But this looks like they're winning. from the line shaft is transferred onto each individual machine such as this mule which uh, converts the roving which is kind of a soft stringy stuff into cotton twine um, by means of further flat drive belts which sometimes have twists in. Um, as this machine comes forwards it stretches the rovings off the rolls on the back uh, onto the little wheels of, um, you know, it stretches it out and twists it as it comes out and then as it goes back in it winds it onto the spools um, and it was this kind of repeat imagery of the lines of rovings and the spools of yarn that made me think of doing uh, things with those uh, conical cardboard bobbins with all the repeat images with, uh, with all the school kids and that uh, which is how the Balper sculpture came about. This machine was one of the machines that really inspired, one of the machines that early on really inspired me about the me mechanisms in the machinery in the mills. And this one they call, I think they call it a doubling machine or something, because it twists several colours of yarn together to make kind of a stringy type thing. And what I really liked was all these bobbins, normally when it's in full production these will all be going round, uh, spin round and as they spin round uh, they go up and down, they all go up and down at once at the same time and um, as they go up and down the, the cotton is thrown in at the same point all the time uh, and so they have the, has the effect of weaving it, uh, of rolling it around the bobbins in a uniform fashion and I suppose if you control the movement up and down you can make all sorts of shapes, you can make like three-dimensional arc writing shapes like a head with a funny bumpy hairstyle and then a big round belly and then sort of a more bulbous kind of legs just by controlling the speed the whole thing goes up and down because I think normally it just goes fairly constant with this doubling machine these in this particular line these three colors of cotton thread are being drawn in by the bobbin as it spins round and as they go I've, once I get past this roller, the circular motion of the wheel twines them together so they make like a spiral and then the, as they go round the cotton reel, or the bobbin rather, at the bottom, it, um, it winds them onto itself and because it's going up and down it does make that uh, uniform thickness all the way up and down. Here we are at uh, Belper North Mill, uh, where Gerard R. Strutt, who this isn't, uh, invented a machine which automated the production of stockings using a, a, a process known as Derby Rib, which uh, enabled the cotton to be made into an elasticated type material, which meant that your socks stayed up. Um, and initially, all the machines just made this flat, straight weed, where straight section of cotton. Uh, which had to be stitched up to form the stockings. Modern socks, such as this example here, don't regularly have seams up the side um, and this has been made possible by the invention of a circular weaving machine which in this case you can see is fed by these conical cotton bobbins which are identical to the ones that are used in all the school and community workshops to make the ceramic little figures that sit behind and on the rotating parts 
of the sculpture I've made for the North Mill. And when it goes round, you can see the, the beautiful movement of the mechanism. It's almost like a wave going around in a circular fashion. And this just goes on for well, as long as the cotton lasts, doing definitely, making definitely long socks. You can make the longest sock in the world. I suppose you could join the thread and make it infinitely long. A sock that goes to the moon. This also links in with, this is the, the same weave that Tan uses in his um, circular weaving workshop for the big woven cloth pieces that he makes. Special about squares. Equal lateral sides. They've got equal sides. What else? No, no. Four sides. Four sides. Four equal sides and four equal angles. Using your head, I like to see that. No, use your chin. Use your chin. This is the first slide. It does. Mommy, end there a bit. Close your hand, lift that one up. This. Put it over. And then you slide that back onto your wrist. Yeah, that's it. Into your hand, pull it over, slide it back onto your wrist. Perfect. Into your hand, lift that one over, slide it back. Okay. Into your hand. That's good. I 
This, but they would use a frame with uh, um, pegs on to do the knitting. Then we can keep it in the centre. Yay! What's oh, <laughs> <laughs> that? Not wrong. Yeah. Oh, hey, she's trapped. I want to do that. What do you think of that? Oh, hello. Fine. Do you think that's someone else to put on? Put it in the middle, straight in the middle. Let's your hand, lift it over, slip it up. Okay? Put your hands. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And then slip it back on top. You need to take your hand through. That's it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> 